And before I introduce our wonderful keynote speaker tonight, I do wanna thank again, our platinum sponsors, the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy and Carroll House Furniture. Uh, both of them have sponsored this entire event, which is just wonderful and may help make it happen. And the Brooks Institute gets a special shout out because they are also sponsoring this evening's program. So thank you very much to you both. Now, speaking of inspiring, uh, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker tonight, Miyoko Shinner. And Miyoko is probably best known as a world-renowned chef and the founder and CEO of Miyoko's Creamery, which is a vegan dairy company that has knocked the socks off the dairy industry, uh, the dairy products industry. And And if there remains anybody who hasn't tried Miyoko's cheeses and other dairy products, oh my God, you have a treat. Um, but Miyoko's work goes far beyond that. More than any other vegan entrepreneur I've ever seen, Miyoko has managed to meld her incredible entrepreneurial talent and her business leadership with her just killer, fearless vegan advocacy and doing so in a way that, that is compassionate, is not uh, vilifying anyone, but offers a vision for the future that anyone can get behind. And that's an amazing feat uh, to combine all those things. Um, and Miyoka's vision is really creating a food system that is sustainable, compassionate, and fundamentally recognize, recognizes that animals have a right to live, that they have a right not to suffer, and that they have a right to seek their own version of happiness. Um, and that's, uh, I should also say, Miyoko founded and runs a farmed animal sanctuary because, you know, of course, she has so much spare time. Uh, and it's an amazing place. I've been there, thankfully. Um, and she's also launching a new entrepreneurial venture, uh, which is uh, working to create an organization that will provide an alternative for kids to uh, 4-H and Future Farmers of America, which for those of you that don't, that don't know, are entities that are essentially teaching children that animals are commodities to be bought, sold, traded, and slaughtered. Um, and that's a badly needed thing. And I, I really uh, look forward to this, the, another success. Um, and I just have to say, you know, it, Miyoko is doing so much for this movement that it really transcends any way to describe it very succinctly, but thanks to the UN, I'm gonna borrow their phrase, and the UN has called Miyoko a vegan revolutionary. And uh, that's a term you would not have heard 30 years ago when this conference started. Um, and she's also been named one of Forbes 50 Women Over 50, which just goes to show the breadth of influence that she has. Uh, and it is my pleasure, and please join me in welcoming the vegan revolutionary and visionary entrepreneur, Miyoko. Thank you, Stephen. I think he said it all. I don't think there's anything more for me to say. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here to see this thriving room of advocates and activists for animals. Um, I'm really honored. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know very much about animal law or any other kind of law, but I am just honored that I was actually invited to be here. And what I want to talk about tonight is really how do we create the future of the future that we want and how does the food system tie into that? How can we really design an ethical food system? Now, there's some things that have been spoken tonight that we need to discuss first. One of them is language and the importance of language. The words that we use will help drive the future food system. I also want to say, I want to thank you, Stephen, for mentioning Rancho Compasión, the farmed animal sanctuary, and the LEAP program that I'm going to speak about later, because everyone knows me as Miyoko's, but honestly, I have been a vegan for almost 40 years. And my whole life has been around activism through food. And that is really how I've tried to touch people, trying to reach their hearts through their stomachs. 
But as I've gotten older, I realized that I needed to be bolder in my forms of activism. And so about seven years ago, I started Rancho Compasión in Marin County, California, and more recently, Lilit program, which I'm gonna talk about later. So let's talk about language first. You probably all know about this, but this is a lawsuit, a, a, a lawsuit that set a precedent, I believe, for the industry that ALDF helped us with. They led this. So who owns butter? That's the question. Who owns the term butter? And how do we actually change language and the way we think about foods so that we can democratize language in a way that actually helps animals? You, you have some of this butter on the plate. Uh, on your table, so you know about it. So in, nine, in uh, 2019, we got this letter from the CDFA saying that we were not allowed to use the term butter because it belonged to the dairy industry. Not only that, but according to a certain regulation, we couldn't even show pictures of livestock on our website or our marketing materials. And they referenced, um, I'm going to show you this. They referenced the cow that was being hugged by a volunteer at Rancho Compasión. And because the CDFA knows can identify every farm animal, they talked about other cows that were in the background. That happens to be a goat, by the way. <laughs> but apparently, and it is true, I checked out this reg. You're not allowed to show pictures of livestock unless you're selling actual milk from that livestock. Milk replicas, this, this law goes back to something like 1947. Milk imitation milk products cannot show pictures of animals because it would be misleading the consumer. And so the fact that we were trying to change perception towards animals, to show animals as worthy of love was not allowed according to this regulation. But what happened? In 2021, thank you to ALDF, we won the right to use to our first amendment rights to free speech. There was a, a, uh, a now I'm blanking. Because I now I'm in a room full of lawyers, like not a preliminary injunction, a permanent injunction. <laughs> so, and we were able to set the precedent so we can call our products butter. Now, let's talk about this. This was a very, very, very important lawsuit that set a precedent for the industry. And, you know, it's one of those lawsuits where people say, yeah, well, that, you know, that just makes a lot of sense. You know, I get it. It's something that speaks, however, only to the intellect. You know, people don't go into Starbucks saying, um, you know, can I have an almond beverage in my coffee? Everyone says, can I have an almond milk? Language evolves constantly. We're going to talk about Chaucer and Dante. We're going back 700 years ago or 800 years ago. And if you ever, anyone ever tried to read Chaucer, it's almost impossible. Okay. It's Old English, very hard to get through. But if you're an Italian and you tried to read Inferno, you would still be able to mostly understand it. Now, why is that? It's because English has always been spoken. Language evolves when you actually speak it. What happened with Dante was Dante wrote in a dialect called Fiorentino or the Florentine dialect. He didn't write in Latin. And on, so he wrote in Fiorentino, but there were dialects all over Italy and the entire population of Italy didn't actually start speaking Italian, believe it or not, till 40, 50 years ago. They spoke multiple, multiple dialects all over the country. In the last 40, 50 years, since the 1980s or so, Italian has changed more than it has in the last 700 years. That is how fast language changes. 
This is why it's so important to embrace the terminology that we want to embrace to create the new future that we want to create. So if, for example, we want a vegan future that represents not only what you eat, but what that food represents, then we have to embrace the word vegan, not tiptoe around and actually talk about it in a way that is inspirational and that is positive. If we tiptoe around saying, well, it's got a lot of baggage. Yes, that's a very myopic view of the last few years. But you are in control of the language that you want to be adopted for humanity in the future, which means that you must embrace that language and start using it and speaking of it. This is how we change it. So this lawsuit was incredibly important in that it got people to start thinking about simple terminology like what does butter mean? Well, there's peanut butter and cocoa butter and all this other stuff. And people just said, well, this is ridiculous. Of course it's butter. No one goes in and says, can I have the plant-based spread? Okay, so it makes sense, but it's not enough to change behavior and it's not enough to change the food system. So what does change the food system? That's what I wanna talk about tonight. What can we do? So I wanna talk about what are we up against? And what exactly are they doing that threatens us or that we could actually learn from? So we are running out of time. And I'm gonna ask you, I don't know how many vegans there are in the room, probably a lot. And there's probably some that are obviously thinking about animals, so you're vegan leaning. But I want you to pretend that you're just a regular eater, somebody who loves food, okay? And I'm gonna show you some slides and I want you to think about the emotions that they, uh, they create in you. Food is something that, despite the surveys that are out like, why do people choose plant-based foods? Well, they choose them for health and then you know, animal welfare is way down here and they have all these reasons as to why people choose foods. But it's wrong because that's not why people choose certain foods. We choose foods from an emotional place, from a place of heart, because it's the culture that we grew up in. It's because what it's what our mothers fed us. It's because a certain food makes us feel good. We're comforted when we eat it. Or just there's an emotion around food. You can't take that out. People don't eat with their intellect. They don't say, well, this food is healthy for me, so I'm only gonna eat that. You may think that, that you should eat that, but how many of you do actually choose all of your foods based on intellect because it's good for the planet, it's good for your health, it's good for whatever, animals? You don't. You only choose those foods once your emotions get to that place. So I'm gonna show you these pictures. So I want you to tell me, oh my God, what a beautiful basket of fruits and vegetables. Does that just kind of make you feel, I don't know, whole, organic, healthy, just good because it's so beautiful? Or, oh my God, zucchini with blossoms. How beautiful is that? This must be truly artisan and beautiful. Doesn't it make you, I mean, how many of you look at this and just go, wow, that's beautiful. It makes me feel good. Okay. And you kind of want to eat it, right? Because it, it just, you imagine if a chef were to use those beautiful tomatoes and, and the beans and the zucchini and create some beautiful dish. It's gotta taste good. It makes you feel good. Oh, farm to table. How nice is that? I don't know what's being served there, but that whole idea, or how about outstanding in the field where you've got these long tables and there's community because if you eat together, you live longer actually. There's studies that show that, but just the idea of eating together, sharing a meal, breaking bread, isn't that a wonderful feeling? Just makes you feel warm and fuzzy. And then, oh my God, the farmer in the field. And now you're connected to the farmer who has his hands or her hands in the soil. What a great feeling. A family eating amongst, oh, I don't know what kind of trees these are. They're not vines, but whatever. I mean, what a great experience. Can't you just imagine being transported there? And then pigs, oh, they're, 
there's nothing wrong with eating them because they had a good life. They're, they're rooting, they're out there in nature, these beautiful Berkshire pigs. So when I have some telepan ham and figs, I feel pretty good about it. That's how people feel. They're not, people talk about cognitive dissonance. And they say, well, why don't, you know, why does it that everyone's got this cognitive dissonance? They talk about the right of animals to live, but then they're eating them on the, people, forget it. We don't, we don't make our food choices based on our intellect. When you look at these happy pigs rooting, it makes a consumer feel good. And when they feel good, they feel okay eating it. Okay, well, when you advertise that these cows are in heaven, or they're not all created equal, but you know, uh, organic valleys cows, oh my God, and I'm a cow, I'm not a science project. You don't even have to say what they're talking about in terms of that science project, but you got a cow looking at you in the eyes and somehow you feel good about that glass of milk or that piece of cheese. And then I grew up in this area where Clover is, and I grew up seeing these clever billboards and signs on all over the freeway and the trucks driving around. And what fun to see these clever ads. And then you see the cows grazing in the grasses, a gas, baby, can you dig it? And you know that every glass of milk, every yogurt can you canister you buy came from a happy cow. And if it came from a happy cow, it's gotta be good for you. I even had someone tell me one time, well, you know, cows can't give milk unless they're happy. And you know what? I grew up seeing this. And so to some degree, I believed it. How many of us have believed this before? Most of us. Okay, until you see the reality, the investigative, you know, investigations from Animal Outlook or MFA or DXC, and then you know. But this is what we grew up with. And this is the image. Tell me what these images do. There's no reasoning. They're not talking to the intellect. They're not saying it's better for you. They're painting a picture of a beautiful life. And then these people are the masters of communication. Regenerative agriculture, regenerative messaging. But it is taking this type of message about the beauty of this current system or what the system could be and making it even better. Need I say more? Look at these animals. And in regenerative agriculture, you supposedly need animals. I can't tell you how many people I know in the industry, in the food industry, in the organic food industry, that have bought into this from seeing movies like Kiss the Ground and The, the Biggest Little Farm and are completely under the spell of the idea that animals are necessary for soil health. And soil health is absolutely everything. And this is a beautiful picture because it connects you not only to nature and to animals, but to the good farmer whose lives we must protect. And I am 100% there with you. Farmers are struggling and we need to help farmers. And when you see a farmer with dirty hands in the ground, a true American, nothing could make you feel more warm and fuzzy about that food. This is successful marketing. This is successful communication. And then you all have to do is come out with a product like this, an ancestral blend. And so you've now taken regenerative agriculture and you put it into a package that has all the words that make you feel good. Talk about confusing the consumer. I didn't know you could milk grass, but apparently Organic Valley can. Okay, so we got slapped on the hand for using the term butter 
but Organic Valley can get away with grass milk. But when you see that happy cow munching on grass, what does that make the consumer feel? It makes the consumer feel great. Now I've been in the food business for, since I went vegan probably 40 years ago, my very first business, the 1980s was this little bakery in Tokyo. I made pound cakes and um, I didn't have a car. I had a backpack and I could fit 70 of them in there and they were a pound each and I delivered them by Subway. And that was my very first business. Um, and I've been thinking about the food system for a really long time. And I have to say something I forgot to say at the very beginning is that my ideas, my thoughts about the food, about the food system, um, my thoughts are constantly evolving. I don't have perfect answers. I'm only just coming out of the cave. Now, if you, how many of you, you probably all know the allegory of the cave from the Republic, but when you look at all these pictures here be before, we have to remember that most people that are eating these, pr these products, that are producing these products, they're not evil, they're not good. As the Republic says, most people are simply acting at random. They, they do whatever is happening around them, they react to that. They're acting, at, they're not thinking through it. It's like if in the, in the Republic, the, in the cave, most people, what they assume is life is actually shadows on the wall being cast by the light that's coming into the cave. And they assume that that is real life when they're simply shadows. And very few people actually leave the cave where their eyes would be blinded by the light to see what reality is because reality can be harsh, it can be painful. I truly believe that we can come out of the cave and not be blinded, but to have our eyes open. I truly believe that that is what we need to do if we're going to change the future of this planet for all living beings. We cannot keep people in the cave. We can't simply, at one time I thought, all you really have to do is change the product. And you just make it ubiquitous and then everyone will eat that instead of the animal product, reach price parity, blah, blah, blah. And everything is fine. I don't believe that anymore. My thoughts are evolving around it because I don't think it's working and we're gonna talk about why. So what are we getting wrong, people in our industry? To protect the good names of these companies, I have, um, drawn a line through them so you don't know who they are. But I want you to look at these ads. Now, first of all, we don't spend the money on marketing like animal agriculture, but I want you to look at these and think about them in comparison to what you just saw before that animal agriculture is doing, okay? Try the burger made from plants. Whoa, smooth and seriously creamy. Dairy-free, plant-based. And then there's a line there, uh, made from plants and not cows and not nutritionally equivalent to dairy. Okay, that just makes you feel really good, doesn't it? Okay, or how about these? How many hamburgers can we produce with 84,700 liters of water? Um, and then there's all these benefits that little tiny tag, you know, little boxes there, a burger with benefits. Okay, I'm gonna ask you this. Is this speaking to the heart or the intellect? This is speaking to the intellect. Does it make you feel warm and fuzzy? Does it make you just want to? No, because we don't make decisions about food with our intellect. All right, let's look at this one here. This is so much what we see on so many different kinds of advertising for vegan plant-based products. We talk about what it doesn't have. It's not this, it's not that. Well, then what the hell is it? When do we talk about what it is? Instead of a list of it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, it doesn't have this. How are we, is this making you feel like, oh my God, this just touches my heart. It just makes me wanna, there is no beautiful life to this. Your life isn't going to be transformed. 
when you saw those images of outstanding in the field and the farmer and all of this, you feel like if you eat those foods, your life is going to be transformed. You're going to go somewhere wonderful and beautiful. When you see this, it's like, well, I guess I won't have that. It won't have this in it and it won't have that in it. Okay, well, we can either have cows that are happy and grazing in the grass, or we can have food made in the lab. Do you start to salivate? If you have a picture of a beautiful wedge of cheese next to a cow grazing the grass, you go, oh my God, that looks so delicious. And, and, and it came from this grass-fed cow and it's wonderful. This is how we're advertising. This is how we are trying to reach consumers. But we just, consumers, I, okay, the industry, um, you know, the people in the industry look at this and go, wow, that's, you know, it's food tech, it's so great, it's neat. But people, just general average people, don't make their food choices based on seeing a bioreactor. It just doesn't get you hungry. So it gets worse. The Center for Consumer Freedom, who knows about them? Well, you should research them because they're pretty horrific. And they are out there advertising against the plant-based industry. And, you know, I get it. There's a lot of things we're not doing right that we have to start thinking about and getting, wrong, getting right. But cleanfoodfacts.com. But this stuff is all over the map. And this is a little at, uh, video. Your word is methylcellulose. Methylcellulose. Can you please define that? Methyl cellulose. It's a chemical laxative that is also used in synthetic meat. And why? Sorry, incorrect. Spell propylene glycol. Propyl What's that? Propylene glycol. It's a chemical used in antifreeze and synthetic meats. P -O. You might need a PhD to understand what's in synthetic meat. Fake bacon and burgers can have dozens of chemical ingredients. If you can't spell it or pronounce it, maybe you shouldn't be eating it. Go to cleanfoodfacts.com. Bacon, B-A-C-O-N. Okay, I guess most of you aren't football fans because this ad played in the 2020 Super Bowl. So it's a one, two. First you show beautiful pictures of animals grazing the grass, and then you hit us over the head with an anti-plant-based product campaign. And it's a one, two. And this is what I hear all the time from non-vegan friends. But vegan products are so processed. And it's true, many of them are. But so is, you know, do you know how many ingredients are in bacon? I mean, it's not just pork, there's, you know, all kinds of nitrates and nitrites and colors and all kinds of crap in that as well, too. But we haven't created this vision of beauty and promise. We're so afraid to talk about it. We're so afraid to say we're vegan and, oh my God, it's so incredible to be vegan. The food, you would not believe the food. Oh, you got to come to my house for dinner. I will make a spread for you that will change your life. And we don't do that. We're almost afraid to talk about the beauty that is around what we're trying to do. Because what we're doing is every single one of those slides I showed you before sans the animals. It's, we can nurture the ground. We can rebuild soil health without animals. In fact, there are countries like Japan that didn't have animals and they had perfectly good soil. And you know where I live in Marin County, I see regenerative agriculture and the soil is pretty depleted and on the other side of the fence where it's just wild. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful ecosystem. So obviously, but that's not why I'm here to talk about. It isn't just about their lies. It's about their tactics that are so effective and how our tactics are not so effective. And here's another one. 
sorry that I'm calling out all of these animal ag folks here, but California has spent, has uh, uh, already spent 200 million and has committed another $160 million to create bioreact, not bioreact, um, met, uh, methane digesters for farms, for ranchers in California. I heard about this uh, rancher in Pennsylvania, this farmer, dairy farmer, who had a completely closed loop system. So nothing getting out at all, um, supposedly. And the question was, well, how do you collect all the poop? Well, all the cows are inside. They never see the light of day. But all of that poop is going to produce the energy for the farm. They don't tell you that methane digesters actually release more ammonia in the atmosphere um, than is even healthy. They don't tell you that. But there is this greenwashing going on about feeding, feeding algae to cows. Um, now they have these goggles that uh, supposedly you can put on a cow's like virtual reality and the cows think they're eating grass when they're eating grain and it produces healthier milk or something like that. I mean, go figure. They'll come up with everything to try to fix a problem that they created rather than simply eliminating the problem. But we have a state, California, the largest dairy state in the nation spending hundreds of millions of dollars to help these farmers clean up a situation that doesn't need to exist in the first place while giving people, like in the area where I live, where Strauss is, everyone thinks, oh my God, they're doing it right. It's such a great product. Um, and it's because they have packaged the message in a beautiful way that touches consumers. Oh, I. Sorry, I forgot to take this out. You guys all eat dog? Oh my God. You guys know Elwood's dog meat? This is a spoof. You have to check them. I, I, this wasn't supposed to be in here. It was kind of a, this is a, a twist on <laughs> humane, uh, humanely raised free range dogs and all of that. So if you haven't checked out Elwood's, check them out on uh, Instagram. They actually get angry emails from meat eaters all the time. Uh, while all the vegans are writing in, oh my God, I love that pug bacon. It was so delicious. So, but anyway, um, so I meant to take this slide out, sorry. But basically, we need to get better. We need to speak to the heart. We can't continue this intellectual only sort of, you know, trying to reach people through arguments and through discourse. We need to figure out how do we touch them through inspirational activism, inspirational advocacy, inspirational legal strategies, ways that will work to inspire people rather than to incite. We have to touch hearts. That is the only way that we're going to change the food system because people don't choose foods with their intellect. They choose foods with their hearts with their stomachs. And we have to figure out how to do that. I mean, a couple of these cases have already been talked about, but these were a couple of cases that did touch people's hearts. There are 12 jurors that started to think about the lives of pigs. And there's a Supreme Court that started to correlate uh, animal agriculture with slavery. So people, there are, these are inspirational ways that weren't in your face, that weren't attacks that are getting America to think, but we need more than that. So I wanna talk about where that brings us and where we can go. We're at a very unique point in human history where we have an opportunity that we never ever had before. And that is to actively consciously think about what is the food system we wanna create. And what we have to realize is that history repeats itself. And if we don't actually consciously think about every facet of the food system that we're trying to create, we could make some of the same mistakes that have been made before. Throughout history, we didn't ever get a chance to decide what we're gonna eat because we ate whatever was around us. We ate what, our, you know, what we were able to grow or forage or scavenge or hunt. And we didn't have, we didn't have the opportunity to say, okay, we're at a unique point 
where we can make any kind of food we want. So how can we do that in a way that is ethical? And what do we have to think about? What are all the things we have to think about? This is an animal law conference. And most vegan food companies think about saving two things, either the planet or animals. And that, that's what they talk about. If we can just replace the burger with a plant-based burger, we're gonna save a bunch of cows. And it's, it's just a very sort of simple dumping. You know, it's just a simple jump. I don't know if that's enough. So let's talk about this. All of these different kinds of foods that are being created, are they all equal in their promise for a better food system? And what do we really need to think about? Is it food tech? Okay. Alternative protein, animal free dairy, plant based, precision fermentation, cultivated, uh, cultivated cell based, or clean meat. What would be the impact of all of these or any one of these on the future food system? What do we really have to think about? Obviously, any of these would help save animals. But what else besides animals do we need to save? Well, there's the planet, but who are the other stakeholders? What about the people? What about the economic system? What about the workers? The food system touches everybody. You know, during the pandemic, we people began to learn about the high rates of uh, COVID-19 amongst the workers in slaughterhouses because they worked in such close proximity. This was the first time and they were so underpaid and they didn't get sick time and all sorts of horrible things. So when we think about all of these foods, we have to think about, for example, Let's say we go, we just replace meat. And I'm not even convinced that simply replacing meat or even replacing meat is a good idea. In other words, finding a replica for meat. Because to me, that further entrenches in the minds of people that animals are food. So if you have a steak that is actually steak because the cells are from a cow, even if it was made in a bioreactor, it's still in my mind, I'm gonna have that association with a cow. And when that bioreactor goes down, how do I know that people won't actually eat a cow? Because we haven't changed our perception towards animals. I want people to change their perception towards animals so they don't see them as food, no more than I would ever eat this podium. I don't want anyone to look at an animal and say, your food. And so are we doing enough simply by changing the food? From a standpoint of human history, the, the fact that we're meat, meat consumption is on the rise and we're eating more and more meat than ever, it's only happened for the last few decades. Who is to say that cannot be reversed? How many of you ate Brussels sprouts 20 years ago? Probably nobody. Quinoa came in on the, on the stage 20 years ago. No one even knew how to pronounce it. Do you remember when you'd have discussions about how to pronounce quinoa? And it took foothold in this country and everybody eats quinoa now and Brussels sprouts and kale. Why do we need to eat the exact same foods that we are trying to replace? Why do we need a center of the plate? Why do we assume that everything has to be identical to what it is today? Do we not have an imagination to envision a different set of possibilities? One of the things that concerns me about the amount of capital going into this industry is that it takes so much money. The other day I was interviewing a young woman in the cell-based space and I was talking to her um, about the amount of money that's involved in doing what she is doing. And it's pretty astounding. I mean, we're talking just to get a cell-based business off the ground is literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Where is that money coming from? Well, a lot of actual meat companies are putting money into that. They're hedging their bets because if something goes wrong and there's a pandemic and that wipes out the cows, at least they've got a bioreactor or two to make cell-based meat. 
So we're talking about an economic system as well that will has, is becoming less and less diverse, diversified, becoming more and more consolidated. It's an agro, it's a, uh, um, it's a industrialized food system that could simply switch over from animals to bioreactors. And we are still gonna have that same consolidation of power where there are the haves and the have nots. Now I might be wrong. I'm just saying, I don't have any answers, but these are the questions that are going around in my head as we think about the future food system. What are all of the possible implications of all of these different so-called technologies? And what's the impact, not only on animals, but the planet, the people, the workers, and the economic system? How do we create, in my opinion, an ethical food system that allows for diversity, that allows for equal opportunities, that allows for, I don't know, just a mom and pop business that wants to create something and sell it at a farmer's market and not have to compete with for millions of dollars. Today, it is considered to go into the food business or the CPG space, it's almost a race to see how much money you can raise and how fast you can get there, get on short store shelves. What if we were to recreate a food system that became, that took into consideration all of these stakeholders, planet, animals, and people. And by the way, that's Angel and Echo. They are best friends from Rancho Compasión, a goose and a cow. She's the diva of the sanctuary, and he is her royal guardsman. Unfortunately, because of bird flu, the, the, uh, he's locked up along with all the other birds right now, unfortunately. So he hasn't been able to bond with his dear love angel for a long time. Um, but um, so yes, we have to think about the animals, but we also have to think about the people that are going to be impacted if we maintain this consolidated food system. Is there a way to create an ethical food system that allows opportunities for people that are regionalized, that are localized, that, that allows for diversity of products rather than the same products everywhere, wherever you go. Um, you go to Europe and you have all of these artisan products in all these different regions that you can only find in those regions. Is there a way to do that so we can honor people and allow creativity to reign across the world rather than Tyson, more Tysons and more Nestle's and more conglomerates. And all the money that's going into plant-based, cell-based, all of that, where is that going? How do we think about it in a way that is definitely, that allows smallholder farmers and small producers to have equal opportunity and for that distribution of opportunities and wealth? Okay, so. The real question, therefore, isn't about, do we just evolve the food or the technology? Is that gonna take care of it? Or ultimately, the real question is, how do we evolve ourselves? We have to change in order for the food system to change. And the only way to do that actually is to touch people's lives in the way that through all of the different types of advocacy and activism, activism and advocacy are still important. Today, you know, there's a lot of philanthropy, well, not philanthropy anymore, just going into investments in these companies saying the fastest way we're gonna get to a plant-based world and save animals is just to replace all the burgers on the planet. And I'm just not sure I'm convinced of that because if you just think back to the when the automobile came along, the automobile didn't get people thinking about the sentience of horses. People still have horse and buggy rides in New York. It was a convenience. It, the economy has never changed the moral equation. Only activism does. And so we have to remember that we cannot abandon activism and advocacy as we try to recreate products for a new future. And we must consider all of those the ethical questions as we think about these new technologies. How will they impact us across the spectrum?
So one of the things that I wanna, I know I'm running out of time. Um, one of the things that I wanna talk about that I believe is touching hearts, because that is basically what we have to do, is this program that Stephen mentioned that I'm really excited about, um, that we started recently. Uh, I co-founded this uh, new nonprofit and uh, ALDF, again, Tom Finney helped us find a pro bono attorney to help uh, uh, set up the nonprofit, the 501c3 LEAP, Leaders for Ethics, Animals, and Planet. And this is an organization that the first hopefully nationwide organization to reach the hearts of young people who are interested in agriculture, to steer them away from FFA, Future Farmers of America, and 4-H or other ag programs. So championing care and kindness in youth over commodification and dominion of other species. So our goals from 4-H to 4-C, compassion, cultivation, climate, and careers. Um, and so we launched this program as a pilot program in January of this year with at three sanctuaries. And the way the program works, uh, actually, let me go through the slides and then I'll tell you. Because here's the problem with FFA and 4-H. Um, so this is actually from the 4-H website. They claim to teach students confidence, independence, resilience, and compassion. But do they really teach compassion or do they harden hearts? How many of you know about Cedar the Goat? Did you guys read about Cedar the Goat? Okay, only a couple of you. So. There was a 10 year old girl in 4-H who raised this goat, fell in love with him, named him Cedar. And then it came time for her to take him to the county fair to auction him off. And a, apparently a, 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 a state senator, I think in California bid on him for $900. What happens at these auctions is that uh, the buyers, the farmers or ranchers or whomever pay far more than market rates because a goat like cedar would have probably sold for 150 bucks, but he was purchased for 900 because they want to give to the student sort of a scholarship. And she was heartbroken. And so somehow they whisked cedar away and hit him at some farm 200 miles from their home. Well, the sheriffs found out where he was and they went across four county lines, found Cedar and took him away to an FFA barbecue. And the girl is heartbroken. I believe she's hired someone and she's suing. I, I don't know if ALDF is working with her or not. I don't know who is, but this is the reality. There are so many kids that enter these programs because they wanna be connected to the community. They love animals. And they think this is the way to get to know animals. And they end up having broken hearts. Rancho Compasión has three animals from FFA, two pigs and a cow from, from kids that had a change of heart. And one of them, we have a, a steer named Louie. And uh, the girl there actually did take him to the county fair and he was about to be auctioned and she was in tears. So she got smart. She was a high schooler. She wasn't 10. She administered dewormer to Louie. And she got kicked out of the county fair and she got kicked out of FFA. And Louie now lives the good life with Angel. Mm -hmm. So we thought, what if we could actually create a program to replace this? So we created LEAP, which is a hands-on educational prof program at nonprofit farm animal sanctuaries that helps students learn compassionate animal care, veganism, leadership skills, and respectful stewardship of the planet. And we kicked off a pilot program this year at three sanctuaries, the three founding sanctuaries, um, with 16 kids, about five kids per sanctuary, and over half of them went vegan or vegetarian by the end of the semester. Um, yeah. And in September, we expanded to three more sanctuaries, so a total of six, and we're still in our pilot program. 
but next year, um, uh, next fall, we're hoping to expand it to 25 sanctuaries across the country. We're beginning to speak to sanctuaries now. We're fundraising. Uh, we want this to be a national program that will actually be a solid alternative to these other ag programs. And we actually have students that have been in 4-H or FFA who have joined LEAP and have changed how they eat. So it's very effective because, you know, kids at that age, they're, they're I don't want to say malleable, but they're so open to new ideas. And so this is when you have to get to them. Um, and when they connect with animals, that's the hard part. When they, when they see the animals as individuals and they hear and learn and actually see the kind of stories that Leah Garces talked about earlier today of, of, of the mother cow and the baby cow. When you actually see that kind of thing in real life, your heart is changed and you no longer see these animals as food. And, and this is why I say, I don't know if we need to replicate these foods. Maybe we just need new foods. They just need to be delicious. They don't need to be the exact reminder of the thing that you gave up. So LEAP is a program that we're, we're hoping will have conventions, national conventions, just like FFA and 4-H. And the good thing is every student can apply for a merit-based scholarship. So they have the opportunity to make just as much money as they would selling an animal, but they don't have to buy the animal, they don't have to feed the animal, and they don't have to sell the animal, but they can earn that scholarship. So we really believe that we gotta, this is the generation that's gonna take over the world. These are the future consumers. Let's let them be the future leaders. This is Erica. Erica was a dairy cow that was arthritic, was gonna be put down, came to live at Rancho Compassion. A cow that couldn't stand at a dairy, I finally realized was actually just having a sit down protest at the dairy because she had no problems running down a hill. The pursuit of happiness is a fundamental right for all living beings. It's not just a human right. This is the world we need to create. And we must be diligent in thinking about every facet of what we're doing and question ourselves. Because if we don't question ourselves, we could end up tripping over the same mistakes that we've made throughout history. Let's make sure that all animals can live a happy life. Thank you very much.